Hello, I'm Chris Slisher, and welcome to Turning of the Wheel, an intelligent, lively discussion about astrology, art, and spiritual adventure. Timing is everything, and as the great wheel turns, we are best prepared when we are best informed. Join me as I explore concepts that allow us to broaden our view of the world. You'll hear interesting topics, meet fascinating guests, and discover who you really are. Using the time-tested practices of astrology, you'll learn how to accept change as the great wheel of life turns. Astrology, art, and spiritual adventure on Turning of the Wheel TV with Chris Flisher. Hello and welcome to Turning of the Wheel. My name is Chris Flisher and this is a show about astrology, art, and spiritual adventure. Today, we're going to go on an artistic venture to one of the finest, most prolific, and unusual artists on the current art scene today. His name is Paul Lafoli, and it's my pleasure to have him as a guest today. He's an amazingly unusual and visionary artist of the highest caliber. His work is highly regarded. It's been hailed across the planet in multiple circles and high art circles. He's a Guggenheim Fellowship Award winner and a very highly esteemed artist who's been in, working in Boston for years. It's been a great pleasure for me to have him on the show today. I met him several years ago. Uh, a good friend of mine who happened to be looking at my artwork said, hey, you ought to go meet Paul Offaly because you guys may share something in common. And as we got to know each other, it turns out that we did have quite a bit in common. And um, we share an equal love for astrology, the cosmos, the sort of the universal uh, divine order of things, and a certain sense of precision and, an, and a love for angle, degree, and form, all of which are architectural elements that also resonate in his work very clearly, as I'll show you when we get some examples later on. But before we go, I want to welcome you to the, uh, the show today, and it's a great honor to have my good friend Paul Offaly on the air with us today. Well, thank you, Chris. That was an excellent introduction. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, I tried to, you know, put you in the proper context. Yeah. You know, you really are a, um, you're considered to be a visionary artist, but you also dwell in the realm of what's called the outer uh, art, art form, uh, the insider out form, rather, I should say. It's more of that, sort of that area of art that isn't necessarily recognized by the mass populace, but has great appeal nonetheless, right? It's a certain well, segment. Well, I'm called an outsider, but I never go outside. Right, okay. <laughs> so it, it's, it's kind of uh, a, a funny thing. I, I think of myself more as a Klein bottle artist. Okay, yeah. Because the inside and the outside are, are together in one surface. Mm -hmm. But your, your background, as we can see from your artwork, really is drawing on uh, a strong architectural base, wouldn't you say? I mean, you have a certain sense of precision, you have a certain reverence for uh, dimension and color, um, all of which have a certain uh, second, a real placement in, in sort of the spiritual characteristic of architecture, but also in the real mechanical pieces of it as well, right? Yeah. As, as I told you before, I, I have my sun sign in the 12th house mm -hmm. and I have Neptune in the 12th house but they're also uh, Neptune in Virgo and I have Virgo rising right so that, that gives me the uh, the sense of having a system mm -hmm. it also puts you into that realm of illusion too it also puts you in that that realm of um, sort of the surreal because much of your work I was immediately drawn to it. I was, I was immediately captivated by it when I first saw it. I said, wow, this stuff is absolutely fantastic. And yet, um, when we look at abstract art in the world today, we see a much different sort of uh, uh, presentation. How do you fit into the abstract world? Don't. You don't. <laughs> because I, I said, uh, as I was telling you at dinner, that uh, I, I dislike composition. Because, in, in other words, so that's why I always use the mandalic structure because it, it is the easiest of, of all compositions. So it's, it's a conceptual non-form, and, and therefore then you can fill in the blanks in, in any way you want. Mm -hmm. And uh, th so th then you're actually in the midst of the, doing the work before figuring out how to do it. So it provides a sort of a, a road map, you think? Sort of a, 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 a map of where you need to go? Not, not really. No, it's it's like that. Um, I, I I want I, I want what's in my head to come out completely there, I see. so that there's no translation. So there's no form, and you want it to be literal. 
You want it to be a literal, literal representation of what you have in your yeah, head. Yeah, that's, that's my Virgo rising. Right. I mean, that's yeah. very much about precision. You're right yeah. about that. Yeah, you're right. Um, but you think, when you think about, um, you know, art, and when you think about architecture, you know, when you're drawing architecture, you're, I'm sure you did many architecture classes. You were a graduate. Actually, Paul was a graduate of Brown University, and then he went to the Harvard Design School, where he was kicked out for, uh, what was the reason you were kicked out? For conceptual deviance. Conceptual deviance. That sounds like a pretty serious charge. <laughs> I, I thought it was next to child molesting as, as a judge. <laughs> I mean, for to be kicked out of a design school, design school for conceptual <laughs> yeah. deviance is a bit of a... You'd think that they would encourage uh, conceptual deviance. Well, no, they didn't. Hmm. And you I, had the same... I, I don't think any school does. Interesting, because they it want gets, you to play by the rules. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I remember when I was working in my studio, which used to be at, uh, on Bromfield Street in Boston, uh, teachers from different schools would come in and say, well, you can't do this. And I said, what do you mean? You, you can't do your paintings. And I said, why? Is, is there a, a, a law against it? A federal edict? You know, something like this? And he said, well, you, you can't mix uh, words and images together. And I said, that's the oldest tradition in art, is to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, the first, the first one who scratched on, on the on, a ca on the cave wall with, was making signs, symbols to connect themselves to the, to the outside world. And that's what labeled you as a conceptual deviant because you were mixing words and <clears throat> art together. But yet oftentimes we see in modern contemporary art, we see a lot of uh, people using words, but perhaps they're using them differently or... The, the, they're not using them for the information. Right. They're just using them like Picasso did. Okay, for, as, as a design as a, element. Yeah. Yeah. Right. In other words, that th that's why I think that they're designers and not artists. Uh, okay. So that makes a big difference. Because yeah. people don't, um, I think that when they look at art with this sort of p precision that you have, and we're going to show some examples on the screen shortly. Um, I want to show this one particular, the survival s strategy of the illusion of evolution, which is a fantastically beautiful image. Um, we're going to get a shot of that up in a minute. But uh, you'll see that there's a great deal of precision, mm. there's a great deal of form and function, and a certain um, construct of repetition, and, and when I, I, I can't overstate the word precision, because it is, there are certain angles and degrees where this actually fits in. Right. Yeah. And do you find that to be uh, liberating in some way as an artist, or? Well, uh, I, what I find liberating is going to sleep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, and in other words, I have to work very hard on, on my paintings right. you know, when I'm awake. Yeah, and they, yeah. Uh, do they drain you? I suppose so. Yeah. yeah. It's, I mean, and then, you know, when I look at something as complicated as this, I'm wondering if, um, if you have this all mapped out in your head prior to doing it. Do you Basically, know Basically, yes. You right. do. I mean, that's what, that's what somebody labeled me as having visions rendered. You know, oh. that, that way. Yeah. But do you think that when an art critic looks at your work, do they look at it with the same eye that they would look at, say, an abstract painting, or do they no. look at it? Yeah, they don't. Right. No, I, I had the the number of years where they said, "Well, this is an art." I, I remember people who were uh, running the building that I was in saw big ones because I usually work in six by six uh, format and. Uh, and, and then you see, he says, what do you do? I said, well, I'm a painter. And he says, well, where's your paintings? And I said, there's one right in the wall. Mm. And uh, he said, no, that's a sign. Oh, a sign. <laughs> so because and, and so I actually had to set up a small easel with, with a, a little tiny this painting is art. <laughs> before he actually recognized it. So, oh, I, I see you are a painter. Oh, right. gosh. The, um, the work is incredibly um, detailed. It's incredibly rich with symbolism. It's incredibly rich with color. Uh, there's a lot of angles and degrees in there. Um, and it's just amazing. I'm going to show it. I'm going to hold one up here real quickly just to give people an idea of what I'm talking about. You can see the precision that's involved there. You can see sort of the, um, the details and the colors that are there. And we'll get a better image of this on the screen in a bit so you can see it up close. This, to me, is art. I draw very similar kinds of things. It's just I, rel I recognize the realm that you're operating in. But well, traditional... Well, flat ter tesseract. Yes. Yeah, right. But people in the art world, um, 
to me, this is revolutionary. This is evolutionary art. And I think that um, you're sort of painting for the future. I think, does that- Well, I don't believe in evolution. Oh. I mean, that's, that's, that's why I did that. Because as you go higher in a dimensional system, you, you pass through what we call evolution. Because I, I don't think we can have the, uh, in, in other words, the, the pride to say that we're the end of evolution. Or the highest form of it. Yeah. Right. Because, you know, when, when you go into a natural history museum, you see s some of those things where, where you have a, a bent over caveman, you know, and then finally he gets taller and taller, and then, and then he looks like a modern man, and then, and then he, stumps, he slumps over again and says, well, well you guys have failed. <laughs> right. We have to go back to something else. Mm. So that, that uh, I mean, the, the, what they should have is a picture is, is a sphere of light as, as the final um, uh, person. Mm. When you, and, but do you think that your artwork has a, is a glimpse of what's to come? Do you think there's something that you are sort of tapping into somewhere that is represented in what you've done? Do you feel? Yeah, the, the, that, that, rep, that is actually my, my dimensional system, an octave of spatiality and an octave of temporality were worked in together. Now, let's explain that a little further. What, is, what do those two terms mean? Well, okay, for spa spatiality means that it's something that you have to care about because when you, when you go to divide something, which is what you do with space, the, the, the space is passive and you are active. So you literally have to care about space. Whereas with temporality or time, uh, you endure time and it can bore you. So that the, the two things are, are care and boredom. And uh, as I, I was talking about, you know, meditation to you in the car, and, and that, that uh, true meditation is planned boredom where, where you try to take on more boring things than you could possibly imagine so that when you come out of it, then you can care about space, mm. and, and it seems exciting. Now, when you use the word space, you're not talking about the universe. You're talking about what we, where we exist in the world, this sort of the spatial realm. Point, line, plane, <coughs> solid, solid, void, vo, vo solid, void, and realm. Those are all architectural terms. Uh, point, line, and plane are the three major architectural points. We have the yeah. point, we have the line, and then we have the plane, which points to the this sort of the spatial, that's the spatial representation you're talking about. Yeah, but solvoid, see, I, I had to word build the, the names for, for higher dimensions. Oh, you made your own words? Yeah. Ah, okay, and that's your own vocabulary, which, now that must be off-putting to some people who are looking at your work and they're saying, what the heck is that word? No, they just say I'm, I'm being pretentious. Or, well, <laughs> or you're being inventive. You're being inventive because you're allowing yourself to you're allowing yourself to broaden the conversation by inventing new words, which allow you to express new concepts and themes in ways that they haven't been expressed before. I mean, people follow what uh, you know, say like uh, geometry, or, or or physicists, and so if you're not represented, uh, you know, in, in the university, you have your PhD in physics, that they they won't believe the things that you say. Right. And there's been many people who, in the history of art, who have been revolutionary in that way. And it wasn't until, you know, later that people realized how far ahead they were, how far, how far ahead of the time they were. Do you um, take heart in that fact? Do you feel as if your work hasn't arrived yet? Do you feel, how do you? Well, all work is in the form of arrival. You know, I mean, I mean, it's, it's ongoing. Well, I guess arrival means yeah. recognition, mass recognition. I mean, you've won the Guggenheim Fellowship, which is yeah. no small thing to win. Um, you know, how do you figure, how do you, how do you sit into the world of, into that context? If you were with, you know, how would you place yourself in that? Do you think of yourself as an, you know, we mentioned outsider before, yeah. but, you know, how does that sit with you? Well, they can call me an outsider, mm -hmm. but I said I never go outside. Right. So, so the, uh, I mean, that's, that's not a joke, because uh, I, at one of the outsider art fair shows, there was a friend of mine who's no longer allowed in the show. 
because of something that he did. So that, that now that they've set up a category, they have admissions. You know, you have to be judged to begin this, and, and so therefore that vitiates the concept of outsider art completely. So there are, there are strict rules for what makes you an insider artist or an outsider or, or, Yeah, right. Yeah. And so those rules, do you find those rules confining? Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm conceptually deviant to the rules of outsider art. Oh, I see. That's where the conceptual deviancy comes right. in. And that happened to you at, at both Harvard and MIT and at the Boston Architectural College as well. That's right. right? And it was because, now when it came to architecture, being a, uh, <coughs> a, a, a deviant, a design, a conceptual deviant, did that mean that you were pushing boundaries with regard to architecture and how it could work? Yeah, I guess so, because I started immediately, uh, a, a long time ago, uh, I figured out how to connect the Earth to the Moon with an actual link. You know, that would go through the Lagrange points and that uh, you could create a gigantic motor, like you can take uh, uh, Fuller's uh, geodesic sphere, and, and you, which is partly a, a discontinuous compression structure, and put it around the Earth at about 12 miles, because th that's where the atmospheres are. And then you have another one outside of that, and, th and then on the moon you do the same thing. <coughs> and then the, the, the connecting link is a, lo a longitudinal discontinuous compression structure, because th that becomes a rigid structure that, that uses only tension and compression uh, separated in the system. Ah, okay. you, you, you may have seen some of those things. It, it was invented by Kenneth Snelson, who was a, 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 a student at Black Mountain College, and uh, they, he, they, he asked to have Fuller teach there. Now, Fuller had no visuals. This is Buckminster Fuller. Buckminster Fuller. Right. He had no visuals. And, and what happened was that he saw between um, Snelson's freshman and, and junior uh, 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 class, that during that summer, he came up with the discontinuous compression structure. Mm. You know, I interviewed him on that, and I said, well, why, I said, why are you doing full of seven? He says, no, it's the other way around. Mm. So the, it's interesting because when you think of the Buckminster Fuller, for those of you who don't know, is best known for the geodesic dome, and uh, it's a combination of geometric uh, interlaced uh, forms that form together that are, uh, you know, they're, they are, that's sort of the dome that you're talking about around the world, right? A sphere. Right? It's a sphere, right. Yeah, yeah. a dome is, 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 like is only just half. Over, over some space. Half of it, right. Yeah. But it's that structure that you might see that uh, you, well, the perfect example that I can think of is if anybody's been to New York City to where the World's Fair was in 1964, there's the giant unisphere that's there as a sense of that. But the sphere is, is and his reason for uh, being behind the sphere was that you couldn't compress it, right? It was immovable because it was all held in place? Well, the gravity is equal in all parts. Okay. So you, you don't need to uh, uh, do anything but just build it. Right. No, so, so the, the connections to the Earth are just simply transportation systems I see. to get rocket ships up to the to the second level because there's two there's two one rotating inside the other, mm -hmm. and, and so that's that's what makes the motor. Right. Do you think there's something mm. in the, in that design that is part of the universal str uh, order of the world? I mean, is there something inherent in that uh, sense in that set in that design element that is part of the universal order? I mean, there's there's those figures, I mean, is there something there that is sort of, um, what's the word I want, you know, basic to the structure of the universe? Yeah, well, the, the two things connected, that's the symbol of the system. I mean, it is, literally, you can't make a system with less elements. With less, they have to have two elements. Yeah. Yeah, in order to make, and because that's a compound. Right, yeah. But as opposed to an element, which is a single system, right? No, what I mean, but, but like when you look at the, the structure of an atom, <clears throat> that's the same thing, that, that the uh, electromagnetic pull between one part and the other are, are, are like the, uh, the, the bars that you could connect I between see. them. I, I mean, when people make models of, of, uh, of compounds, they use sticks Yeah, between. that's true, very good point. And, and it's, so it's the same thing. Yeah. So yeah. now, do you, when you look at your artwork and you mm. sort of, um, you, your approach to this had to come 
at a certain point in time when you recognized something other than just the design character. So every art, art, artist and every piece of art has a conceptual piece to it, and then there's a constructive piece to it as to how to make it. It seems as if your constructive piece, which was how you make the art, came from your architectural background. And yet, you've t sort of taken that architectural sort of uh, model, that construction piece, that has all those finite lines and points and places, and then expanded that to have a metaphysical resonance. And what is that metaphysical resonance? What is, it, what is the message that underlies all this fantastically complex art? Well, um, other than saying I don't know, which is <laughs> possible, is, is that I, I remember w w one time talking to, uh, um, who was who the person that you said is going to be in the outside around? Alex show? Gray? Yeah, Alex Gray said I was an architect of being. Oh, interesting. Yeah. Interesting for him to say that because anybody who's familiar with Alex yeah. Gray's work can see that his stuff is very highly anatomical. Very precise as well. And I imagine that the two of you would have quite a bit in common uh, if nothing else than just your technique. You both work with oils. There's this a huge... These and acrylics. And acrylics. And these spray. Are, and sprays. And, and anything else you can get your hands on. <laughs> and oatmeal and anything else that fits yeah, under the right. thing. But um, in, that, uh, in that realm of construction, there's this... This is precision. I, I keep coming back to the word, just as Alex Gray's work is precise, in as much as it's very rendered to be precise. Uh, there's no, you know... There's no coloring out of the out of the box here. There's no, you know, all the lines are very crisp and clear. Yeah. There's a there's a sense of order to it, That's which right. I think in some ways, as an artist, um, can be very liberating. Because I just mentioned earlier, because you have you know what's going to go where it's going to go, right. as opposed to an abstract Picasso who's, or even someone like uh, uh, Jackson Pollock who's just you know winging paint onto the canvas. This has got a different sense of order to it. Yeah, th this is not drip painting. No, this is not drip <laughs> painting. Um, Although Roy Lichtenstein tried to paint drips, you know, as yeah, if he was right, rendering them. Right, and it, 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 that's, you're better yeah. off going with the real thing. Right. Yeah. Um, when you, uh, but then when you sort of, um, I mean, the words that you choose, the, 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 the designs that you choose have a certain surreal quality to them. They have a real sort of otherworldliness to them. They have almost an alien quality to them. Do you find that that inspiration and that reason for your entry into those kinds of designs are connected to something else that you feel internally? Do you feel as if you have a, uh, you know, is this sort of being channeled through you? Is this sort of a, you know, do you feel as if you're the, re the messenger here? Or is this just, what's, what's the logic behind that, sort of the thought process? Well, uh, in 1992, when my teeth started to fall out, uh, I, I asked a, a, a dentist to put in, or an oral surgeon to put in, um, you know, the dental implants. Mm -hmm. And he said, well, before I do anything, you're going to have to go <coughs> and have a... Uh, a CAT scan of, of your jaw. I mean, the, the mandible uh, nerve, if, it, if I touch that w with a drill, it's gonna, uh, your face will be completely uh, uh, paralyzed for oh, the gosh. rest of your life. Wow. So I said, okay, I better not do that. So yeah. <laughs> I, I went and, and got this, and I, I got strapped in. You know, I had, my head had to be held completely r rigid, so they, they had a, a strap that went down to the side, and I was laid on the thing that went through this, which I call the, the, the hair dryer from hell. Oh, yeah. Right? And uh, <clears throat> so that as he was putting me through m many times, he started asking me funny questions. And, and, and um, one of them was, uh, have, have you ever um, ha had your neck broken? Ah, interesting. And, and I said, no, at that time, I, the only bones that I had broken were, were uh, these, what are these called, the clavicle? clavicles? Clavicles, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. one, one of those, when I was seven, it was detected only because half of my body was hanging down, and I didn't re I, it never even hurt for some reason. And uh, <clears throat> so then he said, well, have you ever been shot? And I said, why are you asking me these funny questions? He said, well, there's something in you uh, in, in your head, in, in the back, and uh, 
I said, well, what? And he said, well, it, it looks like a bullet. And, and, and I, I said, I, I don't think I've ever been shot. I, I, I think you'd remember that. Yeah, that. you'd remember that. Yeah. I, I would. <laughs> and, and I said, well, can you describe it a little bit? And he said, well, it's about uh, three-eighths of an inch long, sixteenth of an inch in diameter, and rounded at both ends. Now, that does not sound like any normal bullet. No. Because a, no, a normal bullet is something that a gas-operated device sends it out, and then uh, it splays. So if it g goes into your head, like you, it would be you, unique. If it comes there, the back of the whole back of your head would be blown off. Right. And and I said that I've never had any experience. I, I even said if you took the analogy of dropping a penny from uh, <clears throat> from the top of the Empire State Building, it would go through you and would not make a uh, m much of an opening, <clears throat> but I said that's never happened to me. I, ne I didn't. I never stood under the Empire State Building and waited for somebody to drop a penny on my head. <laughs> because so, what? What? How? How do you explain? So you have this sort of this uh, <clears throat> geometric figure. Yeah. Uh, it looks like a capsule. In the back of your head. Yeah. And you have no recollection of how it got there. No. So what? How do you explain that? Well, this is what this guy was telling me, and he said, uh, I said, why are you asking me these questions? And uh, he, he was saying, well, uh, I, I'm from MUFON, you know, the Mutual UFO Network. Oh. And I said, okay, so what's that got to do with me? And he said, well, this, uh, it looks like you have an alien implant in your head. And and." Can I bring you into an operatory right now so we can open your head up? <laughs> I said, there's no way you're going to do that. You're going to take that little round saw and, and cut a hole in my head and start having brain pudding for dessert? What? You're, you're nuts. And, and he said, well, uh, do I have your permission to take these to a local uh, MUFON uh, organization? This was in... This is uh, in, in Tufts, in Medford. Incredible. And, and so over there, they, they had a, uh, a physics professor who was part of this. And w what his take on it was that it was a nanotechnological device, and, and meaning that it was a, both a machine and something alive at the same time, but uh, with parts so small that, that if they exfoliated, they, they would fit into a ventricle. Now, wow. th there's ventricles in your head. And I, I, I researched this myself later when I got out of there as fast as I could. <laughs> and and it, it turns out there is a small ventricle that just fits that characteristic. And, and uh, so I thought about it, and if I had had an implant, that might have been the way to go. Because a lot of people who have implants are painfully aware of them, mm -hmm. because they're always wiggling around in your body. You know, right. Witness, of course. Try, but of course. Yeah. It says this one up my nose, and you know, and everything, and and so when a surgeon tried to take it out, the thing would move, because it it should have been in a ventricle where it wouldn't hurt the person. So do you think that this is a receiver? Must be. Wow. Or, or a sender, too. In yeah, other words, right. like, exactly. like uh, I do something and then it goes back mm -hmm. to them. Wow. You know, it's amazing. We, we have been speaking today with Paul Lafoley. He is a visionary artist. He is located in Boston. He runs the Visionary Cell. His website is paullawfoley.net, if I'm not correct, if I'm correct, right? No. Uh, it's w what I have for a, a, we a website is... Um, a, a visionary Cell? No, Gaudi... N N Y Hotel ninety nine at gmail dot com. Okay, that's your email, but uh, you yeah. can also get to him on the web through paulafali dot com. You'll see his illustrations there, and we're going to continue our discussion uh, as we go forward in um, in time here. We're going to get a little more detail uh, in the next segment about his um, ability to. Uh, create this very visionary art as well as his book which is coming out which will soon be in, in publication so we're going to have another segment and we'll be back um, and in the next time we talk to Paul Lawfully and we will pick up where we left off 
Thank you for watching.